now you are looking at Laura Patterson's screen, which is our host today. And so I'd like to welcome everybody to the AMA San Antonio webinar today. This is our second of our 2020-2021 year. I'm Heidi Proctor. I'm the president of AMA San Antonio. Um, also, we'll have question and answer in the chat box. So put those questions in the chat box. And at the end, we will be um, answering as many questions as we can within the time. So I'd like to recognize the board members that are here today. We have Nadia Navarro, uh, Vanessa Torres, and Bradley Labruta. And I'd like to have a special thanks to our past presidents here today, which is CJ Craig and Vanessa Torres. We couldn't do anything without our board members and our um, and our past presidents who advise our current presidents. I'd like to thank our chapter sponsors today. They are Spectrum Reach, AccuPrint, Mark Humphreys, who do our board headshots, uh, Hotel Valencia, which normally our out-of-town speakers would stay there, our partner, which is Paisano's, and of course, we cannot meet there right now, and then our newest sponsor, which is Community First Health Plans, and they're celebrating 25 years. So, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker here today. She began her 25 plus year career in sales and had the great fortune of working across functions spanning customer relationship management, strategic and product marketing, analytics, and marketing operations. Today, she is at the helm of Vision Edge Marketing, which is founded in 1999 and is recognized as one of the pioneers in marketing performance management or MPM. She received a patent for the excellence methodology designed to connect activities and investment to business results. She has published four books, uh, the latest being Fast Track Your Business, a customer-centric approach to accelerate market growth, which has received industry acclaim. Mark Tech Exec has selected her as one of the top 50 women in marketing technology, and as she is honored to be among the top 20 women in business, according to the Sales Lead Management Association. Please welcome Laura Patterson. Thank you, Heidi, and thanks everyone for joining me over lunch today. I'm really excited about having a chance to share one of my favorite topics with all of you, which is creating an actionable marketing dashboard. So we are going to try to cover a lot of ground. I'll try to stop a couple of times and just check in with everyone. I know that I know that this isn't quite the same as being in person where I can see you and 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 see if you have a question. So just just um, ping Heidi if it's something that we need to stop and talk about. So there's a few things that I'd really like to cover, and I want to thank uh, Heidi for doing all the introduction uh, remarks, introductory remarks, so I don't have to go down that path, and we can just jump right in. And today I want to really talk about the value of a dashboard, and I also want to be sure that we can discern between a scorecard and a dashboard. They are two different things, and they're often used interchangeably, and uh, we'll try to find out which one you all think uh, you have. I also would uh, want to tell you how to make a dashboard. As you know, I'm sure you're gonna ask me, there's eight primary sort of main um, components of making a good dashboard, and we'll spend some time on a few of those. And then what goes on a dashboard? I cannot tell you how many emails I get or um, tweets I get or other messages I get on LinkedIn. What do I need? What metrics should I have on our dashboard? And I'm gonna tell you that I can't tell you specifically what metric you need on your dashboard or what KPI you need on your dashboard, but I can tell you some categories you definitely need on your dashboard. So I'll answer that question. And then some best practices. So if that uh, sounds like what you're, you were here to do, that's what we're gonna do right now. So let's get started. I wanna talk about the fact that for many marketing people, and it's not just marketing people, but since this is the American Marketing Association, for many marketing people, we, they, we often find ourselves in a pickle. And the, the pickle begins with the executive leadership team asking the question, what's marketing's true impact to the business? And a lot of folks have a hard time answering that question. Uh, I'm not talking about ROI. We can do a lot of interesting fun things with numbers and I'll share some things around that around ROI or we can talk about some things that we produce, maybe conversion rates, but really true mark impact, that's much harder. Don't know, don't say, and it's, until we can answer that question, marketing budgets will end up on the chopping block. And we're getting ready to go into budgeting season, so I, I hope this will be relevant to you all as you begin to think this through and how uh, this might help you garner some additional dollars. So we have to be able to demonstrate that we're creating sustainable, uh, measurable value. And to do that, 
it's going to take data and it's going to take tools and it's going to take the right language. I, did, I know you probably didn't think you were coming to a linguistics class and we're not going to do linguistics, but we are going to talk about language because in marketing, we have a tendency to speak one way and in the leadership team, the C-suite, they have a tendency to speak in another. So the senior management, they typically talk about earnings and revenue and ROI and market share and customer value, shareholder value, and there's a list of them, which we don't have time to talk about right now. But when we talk and talk about things we're doing, we talk about brand and impressions and clicks uh, or click-through rates or engagement or downloads or you know, GRPs, CPMs, things like that. Those are not really the same language. So to be accountable for the money that we are investing on behalf of the organization, we have to translate that into terms that are relevant to the business. So that means that we have to think about how marketing runs like a business. We often, I think those of us who are in the role of running marketing, we think more like a department. What we need to do is think more like we're running a business. So to run marketing like a business, you need a dashboard. Uh, and that dashboard should allow us to track and manage the function, report on our performance, provide information that shows marketing's contribution and impact and provide strategic guidance, all in business terms. Um, some of you probably follow Gartner. You may have seen uh, a few months ago, I think in July or somewhere in that time frame, they did a study um, on marketing. And one of the top issues that came that surfaced was performance measurement. It's like the second most important uh, effort that marketing needs to address. Um, and we've been talking about that forever. So performance measurement continues to still be top of mind for marketing, for the leadership team, even though it's been something everyone's been trying to tackle for decades. So what should we be looking at? What is the, what we should, and how should we be talking? We have to make what we do for the organization real. That means we have to be able to measure the tangible and intangible effects of what, of what we're doing on the business. Uh, and we have to be able to talk about them in terms of relative work or value, and we have to show what results we're producing. Those are the uh, two most, uh, three most important things we need to think about before we even start with our dashboard. So I want to start with a little story. Um, in, I want to take you way back in time. This is a time machine. We're going to roll back in time to the 1980s. For those of you who were around in the 1980s, you might know that we had no websites in 1980s. There really wasn't anything like digital marketing. Things were very much more traditional channels of marketing, print advertising and direct mail and, you know, trade shows, all various types of things. And I ran marketing for one of the business units at Motorola. And as part of running marketing, uh, I was expected to report every month in the marketing operations review, uh, in the operations review, what we were doing in marketing. And at Motorola, it was all done back then. There, you have to remember, there was no PowerPoint. Uh, everything was done on these plastic sheets, what we called foils. And what would happen at the end of every month is I'd make my presentation along with my peers to our boss. He would take those foils and go to his boss. His boss would collect all the foils from his team and go to his boss and so forth and so on. So there was this old saying at Motorola, if your foils aren't going up, neither are you. And so uh, I labored over those every month. And I know I'm working in an engineering company with a very strong financial bent that I had to have measures and metrics that I was reporting on. And so a few months after I had a new boss, I got invited to sit in the peanut gallery, which is basically the back of the room, to watch my boss present. And what I noticed was that there was not a single, not one marketing slide in his deck. So remember what I said that if you're not going up, if the foils aren't going up, neither are you. And of course, I'm being young and ambitious. I wanted to go up. And so later that afternoon, uh, as Gary whipped by my office, as he was often to do, and drop in and give me something to do for him, I stopped and said to him, Gary, I really appreciate the opportunity to be in the, to see the ops review today. Thank you for including me. I noticed that none of the foils for marketing were in your deck. What could I give you that would be more helpful? And so he took a moment, uh, and he, I just started working for him. He'd just taken this role. It's only been a few months. So we didn't know one another very well yet. And he looked at me, and he said, 
what is your job? Okay, I'm gonna stop the story here and we'll pick the story up in a moment. But before we go there, let me show you some of the things that I was sharing with him because these may be things that you are sharing, like press mention, analyst report coverage, uh, who, we were, who was the event traffic that we were getting at all of the trade shows we were invested in, response rates to our advertising and our direct mail and literature and sample requests and new, new names that we were getting, whether they were from inbound from our call center or they were inbound uh, from events or other ways. Sales quotes and sales meetings and customer visits and design meetings and share a voice, like how did we stack up against the other um, companies that were, you know, selling products similar to ours and all kinds of cost, you know, cost for opportunity, cost for lead, cost for direct mail, you name it, all kinds of costs and expense and budget. So I want to just ask you, how, does that look similar to what you guys report? Because if it does, this is what I was reporting on in the 1980s and clearly it wasn't working. Okay, so I had the wrong ones. Now let's talk about the dashboards and we'll come back to the story in a little bit. So when we report on our performance, there's three ways that we can do that, consistent ways. A scorecards, which are basically uh, how we, an operation is reporting on what they're doing. And I'm going to give you an, an example of the scorecard and talk a little bit about that in, in ways, in a context I think most of you will understand. Dashboards and then reports. Okay, so do you think there's a difference between a scorecard and a dashboard? And if you do, what do you think is the difference? Can you guys put a few things in the chat uh, for Heidi to share with me? What do you think is the difference between a scorecard and a dashboard? And which one do you think you have? Heidi, do we have any answers? No, I don't have any answers right now. Um, okay. So. All right, well, let me tell you what the difference is and then we'll go from there. Oh, here we are. Scorecards tracks revenue. Scorecards track revenue. Okay. Anybody else? I mean, a dashboard to me would be like a dashboard on a car where you have, you know, different things in a graphic. But okay. Well, uh, let's dashboard tracks activity. Okay. That's for track activity. Okay. Thanks for sharing those ideas. All right. So I imagine even if you don't play golf. You've done, you are, have been exposed to golf, maybe miniature golf. You know, when you go to the golf uh, putt putt or whatever, and they give you a little card for that round. And on that card, if you're playing in a regular course or whatever, it tells you what, you, what the expected score is for that hole, how many uh, strokes for that hole, and what the par is going to be. And if it's a regular course, it'll give you a bunch of other information like the difficulty of the course, and it will also tell you where the hole is going to be, all right? That's a scorecard. You keep score as you play, right? And what it allows you to do is see how you stack up against what is known as the uh, ideal score. So think about a campaign that you might be running. You might set a performance target, even maybe for a series of campaigns. And it will tell you how you performed against whatever you said is the target. But here's what it won't tell you. It won't tell you why you got your score and it won't give you insight on what you need to change. It will tell you how you performed for that round against the target and against your competition. But that's all it's going to tell you. It will never answer the question why. Nor will it give you a view into the future, which a good dashboard will help you do. You can't really make strategic decisions from a scorecard. But from a dashboard, you can get to the answer of why, and you can help you mitigate risk. So if we were thinking about it from golf terms, right, we can say, oh, here's what I want to be able to accomplish. I want to get ranked in the top 25, and I want to win. And this is going to be really, really important, this top measure of uh, what we're looking at, because that's what your business is trying to accomplish. And now you're thinking, what do I need to do in order to get there? Now I look at things like greens and regulation or fairways hit to the tee, or putts per hole, or sand saves versus the competition, or any number of things like that, that's really important. Because now I'm tracking my performance and I can see, am I within acceptable operational parameters? And if not, I know what I need to change. So maybe the reason is my short game is why I'm not 
getting those score I want, or maybe the reason is my long game or something, and something very specific about each of those, which you would never get from a scorecard. So think about what you are reporting. Is what you're reporting look more like a scorecard or is it really a dashboard? It doesn't answer the question why. Okay, so the whole point of a marketing dashboard, taking us back to the beginning of the conversation is, are we moving the needle for the business? Can we make course corrections based on the information? And do we know what and why, right? Those are the three things that you need on a good dashboard. And you wanna be able to use it to tell a story, to paint a picture. That's what's really critical, all right? So as you're thinking about what you need to create and whether what you have is where you want to be, those are some, some ways to maybe uh, use as a way to assess what you have today. Okay, so a good dashboard shows how we're moving the needle, assesses what is and isn't working. It fosters decision-making. You can make decisions from it. So I wanna go back to what Heidi said about the dashboard in her car and why that's a great example. So you're driving along in your, in your car, and if you have a car like mine, I have a uh, gas gauge on my car, but I also have an alert. So when my fuel gets to a certain level, this alert will come on, and my car will also ask me if I would like to find the nearest gas station. So I have a couple of things going on with my dashboard, but I have to make a decision. So if I'm bebopping around, and usually my car lets me know at about 60 miles left in the, in the tank, so to speak, based on the intelligence of the vehicle, um, and I'm bebopping around during the day and I'm on my way to a meeting and I'm kind of late, I can make a decision that says, you know, I'm not gonna do that right now because I need to make this meeting. But if I were actually driving on, uh, you know, maybe a trip and I'm getting ready to go on a very long road and I don't know where the next gas station is or how long it is to be away, away from or it's very late and I don't want to get stuck I might find a gas station and pull over and get gas and fuel up so the point being I can make a decision from that same with when your speedometer right there's a speed sign and then you've got your speedometer in front of you and you're looking at your mile your speed and you're making a decision do I should I slow down or is it okay if I want to go a little bit faster maybe I have an emergency I you know someone I have a sick child and I need to get to the emergency room. So maybe I go faster. These are what the kinds of things you need on your dashboard. The whole idea is it helps you mitigate risk, right? Keep you from getting a ticket, keeping you from getting stuck on the side of the road. That's the whole value of a dashboard. You could never do that with a scorecard. It gives you a view into marketing's value and it enables you to make sure that what we're doing in marketing is aligned to the business. And we're gonna talk more about that when we get back to the story. And it translates complex measures into a meaningful and coherent set of information. So I wanna talk about the different kinds of things that you might find on a dashboard and the right kinds of things that you wanna be sure are on your dashboard. So oftentimes what I see when I get an opportunity and our, our company gets an opportunity to review and assess dashboards, because people will send them in for getting feedback from us and you're welcome to explore how we might help you do that. I see a mishmash of things that don't necessarily relate to each other. So what do I see? So there's a couple things to know. First of all, data is the big circle that measures metrics and probably you've heard the term KPIs, key performance indicators fall in. Data is just a piece of information. It could be a country, a zip code, and in the business world, it could be an SIC code, right? It is just a piece of information. What color someone's eyes are, what their education level is. These is just data. Measures are a quantity. Some of those measures are not in our control, like how tall we are, and some are in control, like how much we weigh. And in the business world, things like the number of companies in a particular vertical or industry, or the number of customers that we've acquired, or the number of partners that we work with, or the number of orders that we um, secured in a particular time frame, or our site traffic, these are all examples of measures. A metric is a very specific kind of measure. And the beauty of a metric is it gives us a standard against which we are performing. So maybe we have a target around conversion rate or a target around usage rate and a target around adoption rate as an example. Metrics usually require some kind of equation. There's usually multiple variables and uh, some kind of an analysis associated with them. Lastly, the way to think about a KPI is that it is a particular kind of metric. And it's a metric that you're, you are willing to spend money on to change, right? So think about your blood pressure 
as a KPI or your BMI as a KPI from your health. If your doctor says, hey, you need to get this blood pressure under control, you're going to have a stroke, and he's probably going to tell you some things you need to do, you're going to hopefully, I'm hoping all of you who would get that kind of news, would invest in making a change to get your blood pressure down, right? Because you would want to reduce your risk or you'd want to avoid having a stroke. So that's a KPI. That's an example of a health KPI, and we have those uh, in business as well. So the key to your dashboard is to have this right mix, and they need to relate to each other. And we're going to come back to that in a moment. So now that we've talked about these elements of, of a dashboard building block, how do you make one? Well, there's a few key things you need to do. First, the measures and dashboard need to relate back to the business. So everything that's on your dashboard somehow has to tie to an outcome for the business. What is the business trying to accomplish it? Accomplish? Is it to increase its market share in a particular a segment? Is it to increase the number of customers in a particular vertical? Is it to expand uh, its footprint or share of wallet among a particular set of customers? Is it to increase the adoption rate of a, a new product? Uh, is it to increase the revenue from new products over existing products that are in the pipeline? These would be things you want to know. If you don't know the answer to these questions, you want to get the answer. Because without them, it's going to be really hard to know if you are making answering that question about marketing's impact. That's the key thing. So um, then you have to get your data and do your uh, equations. And we always recommend that you build what we call an alpha version of your dashboard. And you do it manually. You want to kind of not try to, another question we're often asked is, what, kind of, what can I buy to um, make a dashboard? Or can I just use the, the button on like my CRM tool or my marketing automation tool that says dashboard and will that be my dashboard? No, that will not be your dashboard because that dashboard or that data is only relevant to what's inside that application. So in order to make the dashboard that relates to the business, you need the data from those tools, but they are not your dashboard. They are just reports from, of information inside those tools that are presented in a visually appealing way. So then you're gonna review, revise, and create a beta. So we really want you to start with an alpha version that you share internally, that people understand what the connection is, then to make a beta that you're using, then revise that and move into a pilot state. Once you're in a pilot state, then you can start looking for software, and then you can move into production. And it's in the pilot state that you wanna make sure that you've got all your data fields and all of those things matched up and properly mapped. That's really going to be critical so you will be able to automate the uh, dashboard development uh, and dashboard reporting process. Okay, so I'm going to go jump into uh, what should be on the dashboard in terms of metrics uh, and then we'll talk about a few other things and get back to the rest of the story. I want to be sure I stay on time here. So I believe and our company believes um, based on our work in over um, uh, gosh, we're 21 years old now, gosh, time flies, uh, that there are some basic categories that need to be on your dashboard. And you want to have the right categories so that you can answer critical questions. And so let's talk about what some of those questions might be. Like, are our conversion rates along the pipeline improving? Or are we getting the a right number of qualified sales ready leads for a particular segment? Are we seeing our share of preference growing faster than our competition? Are we reaching the level of average order value for a particular a market or a segment? Uh, did we achieve the rate of adoption that we wanted for a particular product by a particular group of customers? Or are we on track for our, our customer acquisition rate? Or are we within acceptable parameters for our, the cost to acquire or the cost to serve? Right, so these would be the kinds of questions you might be asked and you want your dashboard to be able to answer. Think about your dashboard on your car. Are we getting the, uh, good enough you know, miles per gallon? Right? Are we uh, getting the appropriate amount of miles on our, our, our tires? Right? And if the answer is no, then we can make some decisions about what we might need to fix. Okay, so what are those categories? First of all, there should be something related to customer acquisition and retention. Because in, in, in marketing, we have three primary jobs. Our jobs to find customers, our jobs to keep those customers, and our jobs to grow the value of those customers. So we need something related to acquisition and retention. And then we need something related to the growth, advocacy and values so of things like share of wallet or loyalty or lifetime value or even margin for some companies. 
and customer equity. So you can see right now, the three of these six are totally related to customer, right? Because that's what we do. We are a customer facing, market facing organization. So everything we should we do, we should be talking about in customer terms. But we sell something. We sell a service or a product or a combination of both. And so product innovation and adoption is, needs to be one of our categories because that's what we are responsible for doing is getting customers and getting them to buy something from us. And then we don't live, most of us, in a, a, a universe of one. Most of us have competitors. And so how are we stacking up against those competitors? So we need something that gives us an idea of our competition. And lastly, something related to our value, our market value, marketing's value. So here's an example of something that one of our customers is doing to show marketing's value. Every type of conversation they have with a customer has a value for that company. Everything from someone that comes to a chat bot, right, to someone who fills out a form, to someone who attends a meeting, every single type of customer interaction has a value. And they track those customer interactions and they then multiply the number of customer interactions on a monthly basis against the value and they can actually see marketing's value in terms of customer interaction. So that's kind of an interesting way that they've gone down the path of looking at marketing's value. It's not necessarily like ROI, although depending on how you look at that, you might get there. But the real thing they're trying to say is, look, here's what the kind of value we've brought to the company this month. And then they can add that up on a quarterly and, of course, annual basis. So that might be something that you guys uh, would maybe want to take a look at. Okay, let's go to the rest of the story. I left off with the question that Gary asked me, what is your job? And, of course, at that moment, I was thinking, it's over. <laughs> but, and I wasn't really sure what he was expecting as an answer. And so I uh, was pausing, and fortunately, Gary just jumped right in. He says, well, let me tell you what your job is. And he said, he started by saying, look, I know you're not in sales, but let's remember what our job, what, what we're trying to accomplish in our business. We want the top 10 of our existing customers. We want to expand our footprint within them. And we want to penetrate into these particular verticals, and we want the top 10 companies in each of these verticals. We need a new ROM codes for our products because that will indicate, tell us whether or not we're seeing product adoption. And of course, we want to look at product adoption. And then we want to see how we're growing compared to uh, our competition in our category because we're kind of in a new category and we're kind of a new player. And we need to see if we're growing faster than our competitors in the category. He said, so those are things that as an organization we are we're looking at. I need your numbers to relate to those things. And I said to him, I can do that. Now, I really did not know how I was going to do that at the time, but I had a great team. And more importantly, I had a great uh, fine, a guy partner in finance, Enrique. And so I went to Enrique and I said, how could we craft a dashboard that would connect what we're doing to these things, right? So another interesting thing that went on as we began to go through that work, and we did come up with a dashboard that did that. Now, you know, at Motorola, they were very fond of what was known as a six up chart. So they, he, Gary wanted your dashboard to be six charts and no more, two in a column going down. So six on a page, eight and a half by 11, and that needed to be your dashboard. And so we began to work on that. And as we worked on it and produced that, Gary's one day, I get this uh, plastic sheet back with big black marker on it, which is, was Gary's way that says, I'd like to see this, I'd like to see this, right? For the first time after a couple of these had gone through, he's actually seeing something that is meaningful to him. So that was great. I felt like I had won. I took that little plastic sheet and I went over to Enrique and said, look, look, we got some feedback. Let's talk about what we need to do. But what was Gary doing? Gary was actually thinking, and as we began to work together on this, backwards of the journey he goes, oh, they get a ROM code. To get a ROM code, they need an evaluation board, a simulation board, and before that, they need a technical spec, and before that, they need an app note. All of a sudden, the right things began to make a chain. He was saying, I need to understand the chain so we can see where, if anywhere, the chain is broken. And so ultimately, we were able to create this sort of chain. Um, and this is kind of an example. I'll move this over here. So at the very top, the kinds of things, this is not the actual one, obviously. This is on our website, anyone can see it. As you can see it, uh, we had market share, revenue, uh, profit and margin, right? And what were we responsible for? Preference, net new deals, customer expansion, and then marketing efficiency. 
And now we have this next level, which is like our share of voice compared to the competition, our marketing pipeline opportunities, our marketing generated customer opportunities, our cost per marketing uh, opportunity, various kinds of things are now in a chain. So now I can look at those performance targets, those little green uh, air, uh, target signs and see how I'm doing uh, against my targets and how, what is the relationship of these numbers to the uh, objectives and the business. So imagine at the top market share and the number is moving to the right and making the number, but none of marketing's numbers are moving. They're all way over here. Well, that must mean something else, maybe sales or maybe the product group are driving market share. We're not holding up our end of the deal. What if all of our numbers have moved to the right, but the market share number is not moving? Well, maybe somebody else isn't doing their part, or maybe we're doing all these things, but they're not making a difference, right? So that's kind of an important thing to be able to see. Now we have something actionable, way different than a scorecard. Okay. So the first thing, best practice one, is you have to set the right, understand what measures you need. They have to be aligned to business outcomes. And I want to remind all of us that in marketing, we don't market to buckets of revenue. We are customer facing. So remember those categories around customers, whether that's customer conversations, customer engagement, right? That example I gave you of having a value for each type of customer uh, conversation for, or interaction. Right? So think about that, customer acquisition, retention, expansion, those kinds of examples. And to help you think about it, there are, back to our three jobs. If we find, keep, and grow, we're affecting market share, lifetime value, and equity. Find, keep, and grow, do those things. So that's what we, our job is tied to. And then there are very specific kinds of metrics that are close to KPIs that will affect that. So imagine share of preference, right? A lot of people talk about awareness, but really it's all about share of preference. You can be aware of something, but not prefer it. We need to affect share of preference. So if share of preference as a metric is moving to the right, eventually market share should move to the right. And if share of preference is moving to the left on that dial, eventually we're going to see that play out in market share. It will move to the left. So what you have there is a leading indicator. And that is the thing to think about. So here are some uh, examples of different kinds of measures or that you might consider for your dashboard as somewhere in that second level, and then you'll want to understand what's connected below that. Okay, be bold, best practice number two, set performance targets. A lot of times what we see in marketing plans, and your marketing plan is the foundation for your dashboard. Your dashboard is reporting on your marketing plan. They're related. So when I get a dashboard and a marketing plan and they're not related, it's already broken, right? Because here's what you said you're going to do, and here's what you're asking money for, and over here's what you're reporting on. So they have to be 100% aligned with each other. So what I see in a lot of uh, marketing plans are very vague things like uh, create awareness or uh, generate more leads or things like that, right? They're very vague. We need performance targets because if you don't have performance targets, you can't answer this question. Are we operating within parameters? If not, what do we need to do? Because you won't know. And here's the other thing. If you don't set a performance target, even if it's a range, you might declare success, but the leadership team can say, no, they can arbitrarily declare failure. So you want to have a number that everyone agrees to, whatever that is. Maybe it's the number of trials you're going to generate if you're, for example, in a SaaS business, or maybe it's the number of um, new, uh, 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 Appointment schedule, uh, if you're in a business where appointment scheduling is important. So that might be examples uh, there. Okay, last uh, best practice. Remember I said that the key is to have this chain and, and Gary was actually going backwards and thinking that through. You wanna make sure that those metrics form a chain because then the things that we do at the bottom, like driving app note downloads or requests for tech specs or um, you know, uh, uh, boards or whatever they are, those are all at the bottom. And I can see whether or not they're affecting anything up above. And that's how I can make the connection between what I'm investing in, the work on the campaigns I'm creating, the programs I'm creating, um, whether those are through social media or through email, because right, everything is coming eventually to the website. So that's our primary uh, uh, pivot point. 
whatever we're doing and however we're looking at that through Google Analytics and UTM codes, all the different ways, I can begin to see whether the things that we are doing in marketing and the investments we're making in marketing are directly linked to the results that we need to produce. So here's an example of what those chains might look like. So on our website, we have um, this continuum. People are very familiar with it. It's used by a lot of different organizations and associations and educational institutions and companies to help them think about their chain. So at the very top, I don't know why that's doing that, the very top of these are obviously in the upper right-hand corner are predictive types of metrics. At the very bottom, at the very low end, or left-hand corner, is activity. So activity is, tracks things like our effort, like how many emails or tweets we did, or how many articles we got published, or, you know, uh, delivery of anything, uh, how many trade shows we attended. And, and that's great, but it, it's not very helpful, and you can't really make good decisions from that. You do need to know that from a planning point of view, but it's probably going to be very low level at, at, at all, and not something that will be uh, what you will spend a lot of energy on measuring. You need to know it and you need to track it because we'll talk about whether or not we need more or less. But the bottom line is the real thing we want from that is output, output paste. That's really what we're looking for. So uh, at the next level up, when the finance people came to us and said, hey, we want you to be more accountable. The first thing we did was look up what that meant and it meant to count. So what we're looking at is what is the actual output we got from that effort? You know, what kinds, of, which were back to those measures that I had in the 80s, like mentions and trade show names and open rates and click through rates and site traffic or registrations and demo downloads and all of that would be output okay still not where we exactly need to be but better than where we were where we're just looking at activity then along came finance again and said that's great let's get some operational measures on this dashboard so that we can look at how efficient you are so we might look at things like lead per rep or lead aging and campaign ROI and program to people ratios. And there's a slew of them, right? It's a very dangerous place on the continuum to stop. Because if we stop here and we don't look at the to the right, to the outcome-based measures, we end up being hamsters on a wheel because all it is is about how do we get more for less, right? So you want to get to that next level for sure and if possible to your leading indicators, right? So then now that you know what those are, how do you connect them together so that you have this chain? So here's this example. Let's say that out, the outcome is, uh, is 50 new orders from a very particular segment, maybe in this case, EMEA, with a particular target for market share, in this case, 14% uh, in, in the category with a 22% uh, category ownership. Let's say that's what the company is trying to achieve. Now I have a marketing objective that's tied to that. It's all tied to this product adoption target, right? And that's the objective. And then how am I going to do that? Well, here's my marketing program is going to be around advocacy. I'm going to use an advocacy strategy. I now have some uh, programs with performance targets. And then I can tie that to my tactics and activities, which are related to some digital marketing efforts. And in this case, one of those it needs to produce some online activities that touch some number of customers and produce some number of uh, potential ambassadors. For this platform so that's a chain and that chain would show up in that example i showed you earlier of a dashboard you don't need lots and lots of these because the company is only going to have a few outcomes so it's going to be manageable i want to be careful not to have lots and lots of these okay so i'm going to bring us to the end because i realize i'm at 12 45 and i want to have a chance for some interaction and turn this off and just talk to each other and and what's next so the very first step you need to take if you're going to do this for our conversation is um Make sure that your plan is measurable, that you've got performance targets in your plan and that your plan helps you create those chains. Because if you don't have that, it's gonna be really hard to get to the dashboard. And the second thing is that you'll need is those outcomes. You really shouldn't have a plan until you know those outcomes because that's going to tell you what you're aiming for. And without them, you don't really know where you're going. That's like getting in your car and I'm gonna drive, but I don't know where I'm heading. That might be great for a Sunday drive, just, you know, be bopping around, but that doesn't really work very well for business where you really have to know where you're heading and what success looks like. Okay, so uh, if you do want to reach me, uh, I'm out on LinkedIn or you can uh, uh, email me or, um, you know, tweet out. And with that, you know, Heidi, I think I want to stop and just give people a chance uh, to talk. I know we didn't cover everything, but 
um, you know, if you have follow-up questions, we can certainly do that. But let's uh, let's go ahead and, and move from this to a, a conversation so people have a chance to talk. We had a, I mean, people had their, you know, what's the difference between a mark and when we ask the question scorecard and dashboard. Um, oh, so now, that, so now that we've gone through this, maybe people could say, which one do they really have? Do they have a scorecard or do they have a dashboard? That might be interesting. And, and, and uh, you know, do they, because if, you, if it's leading to a scorecard, there's nothing wrong with that. Just need to understand that that isn't going to help you make those kinds of decisions. You know, you don't know when you come back off that round what you need to fix. You just can see what you scored, but you can't see what you fixed. Um, um, I have CJ, do you have any, any examples of dashboards that you have used in the past? It would be great to see an example of what one looks like. Okay, that's a great question, CJ. And that's why I showed you that example. And that's on our website. Um, that example you can use, you, anyone can look at. It's been uh, scrubbed to be um, genericized so it doesn't give away anything for a company. I can't show you another company's dashboard. Clearly that would be, uh, I would be stepping out of school, so to speak. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't want, and I'm sure you wouldn't want me to show your dashboard to anyone, but um, that, that's why the categories are really important. If you think about those categories and you think about your plan and you understand what the relationships are between the outcomes at the top and the activities at the bottom and you build those chains, the dashboard will become much easier to see. It will begin to reveal itself. And I'm happy to have that conversation with you if you need some help. So mostly scorecards? Yeah, so I like probably have a scorecard. I don't know what that, what, if that's a question or if, or if maybe most people have a scorecard instead of a dashboard because they're, they're measuring different metrics but not putting it in a dashboard format. I don't know if, if that's. Right, so remember it's not format, right? I want to bring that up. It's not how it looks, it's what's on it, right? So if you, that's why I find the golf example really helpful because most people have seen a golf scorecard in their life, right? And they have seen, oh, I just am tracking how many strokes I had for that hole. And that's like tracking, well, how many people opened an email or how many people clicked through an email or tracking how many people engage um, in social media, right? You're just tracking that, that's a scorecard. The dad, it won't tell you why, whereas the dashboard helps you look at things like, for example, in the golf, using the golf example to illustrate is, you know, uh, putts, per, uh, putts per hole, right, or uh, strokes to the green or whatever the measures are going to be. And you can be looking at that and say, oh, the reason I never seem to be able to make par is that my putts per hole is really bad and I need to go to work on my short game, right? I can get to the I can get to the green, but right, drives to green, but I can't do anything once I'm there. You would never know that from your scorecard. You would just see a bad number, which is what I see when I'm up there. Yeah. <laughs> you're making you're making these hits, but then you know, if you got better at your at your form, you'd probably be making more hits. So what's affecting that. Yeah, and what where do you need to go? It's like, do I need to go spend time putting, or should I, is do I need to go spend time practicing my drive, my my drive? Yeah. What do I need to go do? And then to your point, what's causing that problem? What's causing the problem for the drive? Is it technique or something else, or bad club, or any number of things? Um, okay, what other? What other? I don't want to get too far into the golf thing, but it does seem to help. And people do remember that example, by the way, and so they find it helpful. I'm told that that's really help crystallize people's thinking and have them look at what they've really been producing to see if what they have is what they really need. And you might need both, right? If you're going to go play around, you need a scorecard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, need yeah, one. I did, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, but what good. other questions do you all have as yeah. we head to the top of the hour? Okay, well, I, oh, okay. Bradley says great information. I'm glad. I, I wanted this to be helpful. And if you have suggestions, let me know. So. Just as a wrapping up then, uh, and then everyone can just finish their lunch and have a few extra minutes before they need to go to their one o'clock meeting. Um, remember, start with outcomes. You need to know what the company is trying to assess is before you can do your dashboard. Uh, second, get clarity on what they expect marketing to do to help achieve that success. Third, how that's gonna be measured. That's gonna give you your second level, your second level of your dashboard and then everything else thereafter will follow.
Yeah, Nadi says great presentation, very informative. I think it's, it, there's a lot and a lot of people will be going, I'm just sending the recording out pretty fast so that people can look <laughs> at it. And then they'll probably ask for your slides so they can, you know, listen so, to it again. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll, let me open up the chat and make sure everyone has the, yeah. That's mine for those who would like to, to. Um, oh, okay. So there's, there's her email address. So you can, um, you don't have to wait for me. You can ask for her slides now. And, uh, <laughs> and then I'll be sending out the Zoom recording shortly. Great. Thank you everyone for being so attentive today. I see that most people stuck it out. So I, I usually take that as a thumbs up in these uh, Zoom webinars. Um, so thank you for that. It was a, a pleasure to be a part of the programming. And uh, I hope everyone stays safe and stay well. And hopefully, um, you know, we'll have a chance to meet in person someday. That would be great. Thank you, Heidi, for all the hard work. Well, thank you. And um, what, since in lieu of a speaker gift, a uh, portion of the proceeds from this webinar will go to Laura's favorite charity, the Humane Society. And um, I wanna remind you some upcoming events coming up with the AMA. We have our Marketing Excellence Awards Pickup Party. It's September 24th at Alamo Brewing. So you can find out uh, who won, if you won, if you entered and pick up your, your award and either have a beer and some food or you can go home depending on how you feel with the COVID stuff. And you know, wear your casual workout gear, casual tire workout gear because it's flex your marketing muscle. October 8th, we are partnering with AMA New York, New Jersey, Tri-Cities, and Austin for a virtual book club. So be looking for information about that. And our next webinar will be October 21st with Steve Cunningham from Read It For Me or Read It For Me. So again, thank you for coming. And uh, I'll get all the information to everybody through email and then everybody that, uh, of course, I'll send out the Zoom information for everybody that participated. We don't have anything else? Okay. Bye, y'all. Bye. Thank y'all. Have a good day.